essentially what we're going to do today is we're going to go back in time because before there were hard clams, there were oysters. And unfortunately, oysters today are sort of a, a forgotten food in a way. Uh, back in the later part of the 19th century, they were an essential part of the American diet. But today we look at oysters as something that is uh, more of an appetizer or a special occasion food. And, and most people probably turn their noses up when they're given a plate of oysters. And the Blue Point Oyster was one of the most famous oysters during this particular time period. And even though real Blue Point oysters haven't been harvested from the Great South Bay uh, since the 1950s, with the exception of some recent oyster farms that have set up in the western part of Great South Bay, uh, you can't get a true uh, Blue Point oyster anymore. But at that time, the name Blue Point became synonymous with a high quality, well-tasting oyster, and the name persisted even though there were no more Blue Point oysters. And, and so we need to look at this from a historical food perspective, as well as a historical ecological perspective, because oysters are a keystone species. They also had very important uh, economic and social implications as well. And of course, I, I like the quote at the bottom of this figure, that eating oysters is like kissing the lips of the sea, because it's relatively one of the few organisms that are, are eaten raw. And so we need to think of a little bit about historical ecology. And the difference between traditional ecology and historical ecology is that it brings in the role of people into the environment. And sometimes historical ecology is also synonymous with environmental history. And so what we need to do is to remember that humans are an integral part of any sort of uh, ecological community or ecosystem, that they affect the ecosystem and the community, are and in turn impacted by what happens in that particular ecological or environmental community. And, and certainly when it comes to looking at the oyster industry in the Great South Bay, we, we see this sort of back and forth between the resource and the fishermen and the communities, and also the communities and the resource. And so the question that you may want to know is, well, what is a Blue Point oyster? It turns out that there are several dozen different species of oyster, uh, only five of which are considered to be edible. And the eastern oyster, Crassostrida virginica, ranges all along the eastern Atlantic coast, down through Florida and into the Gulf of Mexico. And so it's pretty much an eastern species, and hence it's often called the eastern oyster. But what the oystermen did, and what we're still doing today, is that oystermen tried to distinguish one oyster from another as a way of acquiring uh, brand identity, as a way of creating uh, a special demand for a type of oysters. Because to the uninitiated, right, all oysters pretty much look the same. And what's really interesting about oysters is that even though uh, we're looking at a single species, uh, depending upon the environment in which they grow, uh, they will acquire a different taste and a different shell shape based on the microalgae on uh, which they feed, based on the salinity and other chemical characteristics of the water in which they grow, and also the habitat conditions. And so people have termed this a taste and appearance of oysters as a miroir, which is sort of a takeoff uh, for what the uh, wine industry has done, where they talk about a terroir or a taste of the land, and they use this to distinguish different tastes of wines and different sorts of, of grapes. And, and so uh, different estuaries uh, produce different types of or different named oysters. And of course, today, where we see a lot of entrepreneurs raising oysters uh, for market, they come up with some very interesting and intriguing names. And one of the brands that you may see on the market that comes from Long Island in the Great South Bay is the Naked Cowboy Oyster. And again, to, secrete, uh, to create some identity, some brand loyalty. And in many respects, it's not unlike what we see in the craft beer industry, where uh, the individual brewers come up with different names uh, that try to convey a certain distinction and, and perhaps 
uh, attract a, a consumer to them. And one of the interesting things about oysters is that a uh, taste uh, really counts a lot when it comes to the quality of the oyster. And in fact, when you think about wines, they have a whole list of, of terms that they use to describe the, the taste of the wine. Well, we see the same thing happening now with, with oysters, and that they're given all these different qualities to distinguish one from the other. And since most oysters are eaten on the half shell, as opposed to cooked, this puts a special premium on the shape of the shell and also the quality of the meat. And so appearance really matters as much as taste because we sometimes eat our food as much with our taste buds and our nose as we do with our eyes. And so what is Blue Point? Well, hopefully most people know that Blue Point is a hamlet here on the uh, south shore of Long Island. Uh, this is the Great South Bay in here. Runs all the way from Fire Island Inlet uh, east to uh, down by uh, Smith's Point. Uh, Patchogue would be here, and uh, West Savo, which became the heart of the Blue Point oyster industry, is located right here. Um, whoops. This here is the, um, the uh, Kanekwat River, the Patchogue River, and the Commons River. And, and so uh, the early oyster fishermen uh, harvested most of their oysters from this area in the bay, and uh, for that reason, uh, they were associated with the hamlet of, of Blue Point, as opposed to known as, excuse me, uh, South Bay oysters or Great South Bay oysters. And again, this is simply a, a marketing tool to distinguish a particular type of eastern oyster. And what we need to do is to consider a little bit about uh, the life history of the eastern oyster, because this played a major role in how the oyster industry uh, evolved and how oysters are managed. And so oysters uh, live on the benthos, they're epibenthic, they form large structures or oyster reefs or oyster beds. The sexes are, are separate, and then come around uh, June or July when the water temperatures are rising, uh, the rising temperature will cause the male to release his sperm into the water. Oysters are, are filter feeders, feeding in the microalgae in the water overlying them. And when the females detect the sperm as they're feeding, this will cause them to release their eggs into the water. And that is where fertilization is going to take place. And then the fertilized egg uh, within uh, 24 hours develops into the first larval stage. It then will develop a small a shell uh, known as a velager. It has a, a velum up in here, which is a ciliated structure by which the larvae is able to swim in the plankton and able to uh, feed as it does so. And so for about 14 to 21 days, depending upon a temperature and food supply, uh, the small oyster is in the plankton. Uh, this allows for it to disperse into new areas. Uh, it then will uh, undergo a, a gradual metamorphosis and will develop a, a foot. And a foot is a characteristic of the phylum mollusca. It becomes known as a pettivelliger, uh, petty from the word foot. And so it alternates between swimming and uh, crawling along the bottom because oyster larvae have to pick out a good habitat in which to metamorphose because they have to choose wisely. They only get one uh, chance at it. And eventually the petty villager will find what is to be a suitable habitat, often uh, an area of oyster shell where there are other oysters because uh, um, it assumes, I guess, that if there's oysters here already, this must be a good place for me to settle down and to spend the rest of my 10 to 14 years of life unless I am harvested when I reach three or four years of age. The process of going from the plankton to the benthos is known as a setting. Uh, the process often results in a set of oysters. The young oysters now that measure a little bit larger than the head of a pin are known as early spat, and sometimes the setting process is known as a spatfall, where the oyster larvae fall out of the plankton. Uh, they're attached to the bottom, and there they'll spend the rest of their life, and about age three or four, they will start to um, 
be able to reproduce. Now, oysters were economically very important uh, for the oyster industry. They were an important food supply. Uh, they made a very unique contribution to the American diet because they were relatively inexpensive. They were relatively abundant. And it was one of the few, few foods that would cross all of the different social economic uh, divisions in American society. And remember that during the 19th century, we did not have extensive amount of refrigeration. So keeping beef and pork and poultry, if you could find it and if you could afford it, uh, was very, very difficult. And so because oysters would keep for a fairly long time out of water, if they were kept cool and damp, uh, they also could survive a uh, transport from the coast into the interior part of the country. But now we recognize that oysters, in addition to their economic and food value, uh, also provide a number of ecosystem services. And so in addition, sorry, in addition to uh, the production, uh, water quality is an important aspect of what oysters do because they are filter feeders. And in many places, people now realize that uh, putting out oysters is a good management control uh, for water quality because it's going to remove the excess uh, phytoplankton in the water. Uh, they create uh, habitat for other species, tremendous diversity associated with all the nooks and crannies uh, that are associated with an oyster reef. And of course, oysters are often referred to now as an ecosystem engineer because they're going to create a habitat uh, for themselves as well as a diversity of, of fin fish uh, and a variety of crustaceans and other types of invertebrates. They can uh, sequester carbon uh, by taking the carbon, calcium carbonate out of the water and using it in the manufacture of, of their shell so they can play a role in um, um, reducing carbon uh, concentrations. But at the same time, this makes them very vulnerable to ocean acidification. And in certain areas, the ocean acidification is uh, really jeopardizing uh, the viability of oyster uh, populations. Mentioned that they provide habitat for fish. There's a lot of interest now in using oysters uh, to stabilize habitats and, and shoreline. Uh, they provide which is a, a sort of a natural armoring against a wave attack. And uh, there was a recent study that was released that said that uh, the impact of Hurricane Sandy was much, Superstorm Sandy was much greater than it would have been because there are no more oysters in, uh, in New York Harbor. And it also creates a diversification of the landscape and the ecosystem. And so uh, you can see that uh, many marine habitats are a mosaic of sand and mud and oyster shell. Uh, many people now consider uh, oysters to be a, a keystone species, again, because the impact that they have on their environment. So let's go back now and look at oysters during the 19th century. And during the 19th century, it really was the, the golden age of the oysters. It was oysters, oysters all the time. And oysters were shipped from coastal areas on trains, on uh, boats, uh, any way that you could get them uh, to the inland. And in fact, uh, Abraham Lincoln, when he was uh, living in, uh, in, in the Midwest, uh, found oysters to be uh, one of his favorite foods. And he would often uh, have them as part of his uh, fundraising uh, process. And so in New York City, you could go in and, and you could see where there would be oyster stands on the streets of, of Manhattan. And people would eat oysters on the half shell. They'd eat them in stews and so forth. It was really a food for the, for the masses during the time. And so there was this tremendous uh, demand for oysters. And in fact, the demand for eastern oysters was so great that large quantities of eastern oysters were actually loaded up onto the Transcontinental Railroad when it was completed right after the Civil War and shipped out to San Francisco, where the miners who had all come from the East Coast had the money and the desire to pay for the cost of shipping these oysters. And believe it or not, the Blue Point oyster was shipped in fairly large numbers to England 
during the latter part of the 19th century through the 1920s, and it became a preferred food of many of the poorer classes in England during uh, this time period. And, and so we had a very different relationship with oysters 200 years ago than we do today. And, and just to give you a sense of perspective, uh, these are some uh, statistics uh, related to uh, the oyster in, in New York City. And uh, large quantities of oysters were harvested, um, and they were uh, in the millions of oysters. Um, just to give you another sense, uh, these are oyster barges that were docked along the East River. Um, they were tied up so that the um, bow end of the oyster barge was right along the shoreline, and the back was right along the river. And so schooners and sloops could sail up to the back of these barges. They could unload their supply of oysters. They'd be brought inside these barges where they would then be separated by size. Uh, and most of them were picked up by uh, markets and restaurants uh, that would come to, along to the front of the, of the oyster barge um, and pick up their oysters. And you, you can see barrels of oysters uh, waiting to be uh, picked up. And during the heyday, there were probably uh, 100 different oyster barges that were tied up along the waterways uh, of New York. And there was only one remaining oyster barge left today. Uh, it actually ended up in uh, Connecticut. And recently, uh, a number of preservationists have gotten together. Uh, they have dismantled it and are bringing it back to, to New York City uh, as a reminder of the golden age of oysters. Um, I just wanted to mention this real quickly. Um, when most people look at this and you ask them what they are, they say, well, it's a, a Chinese uh, food container, a and rightly so, but it actually predates the, uh, the uh, popularity of Chinese food in this country which followed the Second World War and dates back to the 1890s. And in the 1890s, it was known as a oyster pail. And what the oyster men would do is they'd often uh, shuck or open their oysters in, in fish houses and oyster shanties along the shoreline and then just pack up the oyster meats into cans that they'd pack with ice and then they'd be shipped to markets throughout the country. And that once they got to the markets, uh, people would come and want to buy their oysters for their meal. And before there was glass and before there was plastics, uh, this little paper uh, container served as a way of taking these oyster meats uh, home so that you could cook uh, them later for your uh, dinner. And of course, if you've ever taken one of these apart, these are one of the most ingenious pieces of work. Right? It's a, a pail that's essentially origami. It's a one piece of uh, paper, uh, like cardboard, that has been treated with wax to, uh, to make it water resistant. And, and so the, the Chinese food industry, the takeout Chinese food industry, really owes a debt to this, uh, to this oyster pail that was uh, developed and patented in the late 1890s. And so demand during the 1890s uh, was really uh, increasing. And uh, by the 1850s, um, the natural oyster populations throughout the Northeast could not really meet the demand for oysters. And so oystermen during this time, being rather entrepreneurial, uh, began what became known as the cultivation or farming of oysters to try to meet this uh, demand. And so today we would call this uh, the mariculture and would be the farming of, of oysters. Uh, the big difference between cultivation in the 19th century and today is that the oysters that were cultivated were all a natural product and involved taking rather small set and rather small spats and then moving them around from one area to the other, whereas today, most of the farmed oysters uh, originate in shellfish hatcheries where the oysters are spawned under controlled conditions, raised during their larval period, and then sometime after they have set, uh, taken out and deployed into the natural in environment. And, and so oystermen would, would go out and look for these small spat or, or seed oysters. They would harvest them, move them to another area, 
essentially transplanting them and uh, became known as a, a planting. Uh, the men who would do this became known as oyster planters. And so they would move them from one area to another. And in some cases, they would uh, take the shell uh, uh, from shucked oysters and spread them along the bottom in certain areas in order to catch a set. And so again, this takes uh, into account the fact that oysters need a hard material to uh, set upon for their uh, metamorphosis. And so when we look at the Blue Point oyster in the Great South Bay, it began essentially as a, a wild harvest fishery. And that once the uh, wild harvest could not beat the demand, uh, it switched over to a cultivated oyster industry. And, and so uh, by the early years of the 20th century, uh, perhaps five-sixths of the oysters that were harvested from the bay were actually considered to be uh, cultivated oysters. Uh, and the remainders were those that were harvested as wild stock. Now, the Great South Bay, long linear bay, it has an inlet down here at Fire Island. Uh, the easternmost inlet today is Merchis Inlet, but during the 19th century it was not open. And in fact, Merchis Inlet didn't open up until 1931. And so there was a large gradient, east-west gradient, in terms of the salinity in terms of the microalgae in the, in the water for the oysters to uh, feed upon. And most of the oyster beds were located east of Nickel Point. And each one of these sort of bluish blots here uh, represents a uh, oyster reef. And most of the oyster reefs, most of the natural grounds, were located between Blue Point and Smith Point. There were a few oysters between Blue Point and Nickel Point, but not as significant. And what was really of great interest was the fact that because salinities in the Eastern Bay were low, uh, oysters tended to set uh, there with a fairly high frequency. But because the salinity was low and the type of microalgae that was present, the oysters uh, didn't grow very well. But when you got from Blue Point to Nickel Point, uh, the situation was reversed. The oysters would not set but they would grow very quickly if you could get them there. And so what happened in the industry was that uh, oystermen, and it happened sometime around 1847 in the Great South Bay, it was happening up and down the eastern seaboard by this time, uh, some oystermen, for whatever reason, decided, hey, let's go out and harvest some seed oysters from the eastern bay and bring them up to the western bay. Let's see how well they do. Again, essentially emulating the industry practices that were happening in Long Island Sound, down in the Chesapeake, uh, and the rest of the East Coast. And when they returned uh, two years later, according to the, to the story, they found that their oysters had survived, that they had grown, and what was a bushel of, of seed oysters, very small oysters, uh, had matured into several bushels of market-sized oysters. And so this set the stage for transplanting oysters from the eastern part of the bay to the western part of the bay. Now, we need to think about this in terms of the ecological impacts because you were first of all shifting oysters from one area to the other. And when you shift oysters from one area to the other, think about them and how it's going to change uh, their water quality filtration. And so in the western part of the bay, not many oysters naturally, you add more seed oysters, water filtration is going to increase. In the eastern bay, you're taking away filter feeders, and so the rate of filter feeding is going to become diminished. You're also going to change habitat, you're going to reduce the amount of shell in the eastern bay and increase it in the western part of the bay. Now, accompanying this change in the oyster industry, was a change in the ownership and management of the underwater lands. Because let's say that you are an industrious oysterman and you wanted to transplant oysters. Well, you needed to make sure that where you planted your oysters, you would be the only one that would have access to them. You needed to secure a private property right. And in the case of the Great South Bay, uh, most of the Great South Bay is owned or within the jurisdiction of the town of Brookhaven. 
at least as far as Nickel Point. When you get west of Nickel Point, it's in the town of Islip, and west of that, uh, just to the west of the Robert Moses Bridge, it's the town of Babylon. So it was public lands. And so this meant that the entrepreneurial oyster planters had to some way get an ownership right to the Bay Bottom so that they could be the only ones to benefit from their labors. And, and this gave rise to the practice of leasing of Bay Bottom. And so oystermen would go to the town of Brookhaven and they would ask the town officials, I want to lease some underwater land. And the town was very happy to accommodate them because they would get the rental from the, uh, from the lease. And this, of course, would be used to, to defray any sort of taxes or levies that they would have to make otherwise. And it also really supported the economic engine of the oyster industry because the oyster industry uh, supported the oyster, harvested, uh, oyster harvesters. It supported a major uh, boat building industry in Patchogue. Uh, it supported the men on shore who would process the oysters, the shippers, and so forth. So, you know, for every job harvesting oysters, there were four or five other jobs uh, that were uh, created. But, of course, every time an acre of Bay Bottom was leased, this made it unavailable to the baymen who chose not to be oyster planters. And so, as more, eat, uh, more acres were leased, there were fewer acres of, of Bay Bottom. And what we saw then was this creation of a class distinction in the Great South Bay that was divided up between the oyster planters and the free baymen, or those that would work the natural beds. Most of the oyster planters were, were focused from Nickel Point uh, to um, Blue Point, and the most of the natural harvesters were working east of, of Blue Point. But it still provided a great deal of social uh, conflict and on several occasions, it was said that a, a war would break out between the oystermen, the oyster planters, and the, and the free baymen. And essentially all it meant was that some of the free baymen, uh, as an activity of, of, of civil disobedience, would go and poach on the planter's bottom and steal their oysters. But again, it became a very divisive social issue during this time. And in the case of the trustees of the town of Brookhaven, became a very important uh, political issue and, and dominated some of the uh, decisions and the elections during the 1880s through the 1890s. Well, the Blue Point Oysters industry's boom years was probably around 1880 to around uh, 1910. Again, demand was increasing. Uh, there was a tremendous supply of seed oysters uh, that would be brought in into the bay. And so the industry really took off. And so mostly around the shores of West Sable, uh, to a little extent around Oakdale, on the uh, estate of uh, where LaSalle Military Academy was, uh, you'd see these uh, oyster uh, houses or oyster shanties being established. And this is where the oysters would be brought in. Uh, some of them were packed in barrels to be shipped to uh, the East Coast and to England. Others of them were opened up uh, put into containers with ice and then shipped out to the Midwest and other areas. Uh, you often saw these sorts of structures uh, right along the shoreline. Uh, these are known as oyster floats. And what the oystermen would do is they would harvest their oysters from their beds out in the main part of the bay and then bring them into these oyster floats where they would uh, uh, temporarily store them in water. Uh, this would uh, allow the oysters to uh, cleanse themselves of any grit or debris and also made it possible for the oystermen uh, to get oysters rather quickly in the event that they could not get out to the bay because of weather or because of icing in the bay. The center of the industry uh, was located uh, here in, uh, in uh, West Sable. Uh, most of the oyster planting occurred between Nickel Point here and uh, Blue Point here. This was the area that was mostly leased this area out in here was mostly uh, free bay, uh, where there was no leasing on the uh, bottomlands. Now, in order to increase the seed supply, oystermen would go uh, up and down the East Coast to find sources of their uh, seed. And, and one of the major sources of oyster seed uh, for the Blue Point oyster industry was Connecticut. 
Uh, there were major uh, oyster seed beds located off of New Haven and off of uh, Bridgeport. And the Connecticut oyster industry evolved that it became more one of supplying seed oysters than of supplying uh, market oysters. And so um, when the oysters in Connecticut uh, uh, reached uh, three or four years of age, uh, they would be dredged up in the spring and then transported to the Great South Bay where they would be spread on the bottom of these lease plots. Uh, perhaps around 250 bushels of the uh, shell and the oyster spat spread out along the bottom. Uh, they would spend uh, a year or two on the bottom, uh, feeding on the microalgae, uh, growing, and then by the uh, first or second fall, uh, they would be large enough to be harvested and uh, sold for market. And this industry grew rather rapidly. And in fact, uh, by 1896, as this headline from the New York Times says, that uh, Connecticut claimed most of the credit for the Blue Point oyster production, because perhaps uh, three quarters to 90% of the oysters that were harvested from the Great South Bay actually began in uh, Long Island uh, Sound. Uh, the natural production in the bay just could not meet the demand for this seed. And so, to a certain extent, the growth of the Blue Point oyster industry was contingent upon this seed availability coming from, coming from Connecticut. And this just gives you a sense of uh, how many oysters were brought in uh, by these oyster planters. It became a big industry. And again, oyster planting did have a number of impacts on the environment of the bay, particularly with respect to habitat, particularly with respect uh, to water quality. The industry really began to uh, decline in, in 1910 uh, for a number of uh, very important social reasons. By 1955, it had essentially ended in the bay. Part of the issue was a change in ownership in the bay bottom. And this was reflected by this area here, uh, was sold uh, to a, a company known as Seal Ship Oyster. It uh, has a long tangled history. Uh, it goes back to colonial times where there were competing um, ownership claims. And this part of the bottom, because of some uh, court actions, uh, became uh, privately owned. The Seal Ship Oyster Company was an interesting entity. It tried to create a monopoly in the oyster industry during the great age of the monopolies in oil and coal and uh, steel. Um, and very quickly picked up all the properties in the bay. In the process, they drove out many of the independent oystermen that were planting, consolidated it into one company, so they lost an important part of their uh, strategic uh, diversity. Around this time, the seed industry in Connecticut started to collapse. Uh, what had been regular oyster sets every year uh, became very sporadic and non-existent, and so there were no more oyster seeds to really be brought in. Could be speculated that changes in riches uh, in Fire Island Inlet, and you can see here the westward growth of uh, Fire Island Inlet may have changed its circulation and flushing in the bay and that could have altered the environment of the bay. By the 1910s, uh, oysters started to fail to reproduce in the Great South Bay. Uh, this caused the New York Conservation Commission and the Fisheries Bureau to do a number of investigations. They actually uh, started the first shellfish hatchery to grow oysters in a building in, uh, in West Saville as a way of restoring the oyster industry. Well, the monopoly failed, um, but before it collapsed, it gave rise to the Blue Points Company. Uh, this gentleman over here is known as Jacob Ockers. He was the oyster king. And so uh, when this happened, the industry was essentially uh, a sole uh, private company um, by 1917. And then public health became an issue. Uh, there were a number of typhoid outbreaks tied to uh, eating oysters, and so people said, hey, you know, oysters may improve my love life, but they're going to kill me, so I'm not going to uh, eat them anymore, so demand fell, and by 1925, eating oysters uh, was no longer considered to be a, a good thing to do. 
1931, Rich's Inlet opened, raised the salinity. This little snail here, the oyster drill, loved these higher salinities and increased in abundance, wiped out the seed that was being grown in the eastern part of the bay and the adult population, and so the oyster industry took a real hit. By the 1950s, the duck farming industry in Rich's Bay was causing widespread water quality issues, and that uh, this gave rise to something known as the small form blooms here, small forms, harmful algal bloom, that uh, proved to be very poor food for oysters. And by the 1950s, the Blue Point oyster industry was essentially over. But I guess the good news was, at least temporarily, uh, it was replaced by the hard clam industry. Now, uh, there has been a move to return Blue Point oysters to the bay. Uh, this was made possible in large part by the town of Islip when it decided to lease some uh, underwater lands up by Fire Island Inlet so that entrepreneurial oystermen could uh, lease between two and five acres from the town on which they could grow their oysters. And so some of the oystermen uh, get their oysters and then plant them into floating bags. Uh, some of them put them onto a rack and tray system. And so now we are seeing a return of the Blue Point oyster into the uh, Great South Bay. So, on that note, I think I will uh, quit and be happy to answer any questions that you may have. We have time for one question. Yes, sir. What's the uh, rate of filtering water typical oyster per day? Well, they talk about it as uh, 50 gallons per day for an adult oyster. You know, and you can go on YouTube and you can find some videos that show an aquarium that's essentially, you can't see through it because it has so much algae. Put an oyster in it, within a couple hours, it's essentially clear again. Yes. There, there were numerous oyster bins along the shore of the Great South Bay. Uh, many of them were destroyed as part of the development along the shoreline of the, of the bay. Um, many of them were actually mined for their oyster shell because oyster shell was uh, used for uh, road paving. It was an important paving uh, material. Uh, they were also harvested for their uh, shell and ground up into chicken feed. Uh, and it fed the chickens because it made the chicken shells uh, a little bit uh, uh, thicker and, and harder. So there's a few places in Nassau that's been preserved where they have found uh, uh, old uh, oyster shells, but not in any appreciable numbers. But they were here. <laughs> we're, we're out of time. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Thanks, Jeff.